So this is a section of scripture that I was really, really um, reading while I was away, and I thought I was reading it personally, but I think according to the Spirit of God, the best as I can discern, that it wasn't just for me, it was for us. And since it's in the Word of God, I've got to believe it's for everybody anyway. I just wanted to make sure of its timing. It's going to be in three parts, maybe four, maybe two. You know, that's up to the Lord, but we're not going to get through it all today. And I have good news and bad news. The good news is the third part is excellent. The bad news is we've got to get through the first two parts to get there. <laughs> so why don't we go to the Scriptures and take a look at these 11 verses that we're going to be dealing with over the next three weeks. And the crescendo is verse 11. It says, One day as Yeshua was standing on the shore of Lake Gennaret with the people pressing in around him in order to hear the word of God, he noticed two boats pulled up on the beach, left there by the fishermen who were cleaning their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Shimon, and asked him to put out a little way from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Shimon, quote, put out into deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Continuing, Shimon answered, quote, we've worked hard all night long, Rabbi, and haven't caught a thing. But if you say so, I'll let down the nets, end quotes. They did this and took in so many fish that their nets began to tear. So they motioned to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats to the point of sinking. When he saw this, Shimon Kepha fell at Yeshua's knees and said, quote, get away from me, sir, because I'm a sinner. Continuing, for astonishment has seized him and everyone with him at the catch of fish they had taken. And likewise, both Yaakov and Yochanan, Shimon's partners. Quote, don't be frightened, Yeshua said to Shimon. Quote, from now on you will be catching men alive. And this is, this is the key. This is what we'll take care of probably week three, Lord willing. And as soon as they had beached their boats, they left everything behind and followed him. Okay, we'll break down. We'll try to get through maybe to verse five. And then maybe next week we'll do verse 6 through 10, and then we'll finish with verse 11, because that's really the crux of it. That's really the message. Um, let's do the first three verses for a moment. It said, one day as Yeshua was standing on the shore of Lake Canaan, it's, it's not ultra important, but it's not the Sea of Galilee. By definition, it's not a sea. It's a lake, and it's fed by the Jordans coming out of Mount Hermon, the headwaters. So is that important? I don't know. You know what? I don't know. But you know... Some people think I'm technical or I deal with semantics, but, you know, words are very important. Yeah. One little word can change anything. Just ask Charles Taze Russell of the Jehovah Witnesses. Yeah. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was... A, isn't that amazing? One letter changes the whole Messiah. So I'm, if I seem a little technical, or if I seem a little uptight at times... Maybe I'm uptight. Maybe you're too loose. I don't know. <laughs> it all depends on perspective. I'd rather have God say to me, man, you took this too seriously then. You didn't take it seriously enough. Just my humble opinion. So it's a lake. Canaret is the harp. And it, why is it called Lake Canaret? Because it looks like a harp. So somebody said, hey, that looks like a canaret. Let's call it Lake Canaret. With the people pressing in around him, why were they pressing and look? He was the son of God, and he had the anointing like nobody will ever have. He received it without measure, meaning at all times, he was full of God. Amen. Completely like if you went into his tabernacle, there was no room for anything else. He was chock full of the Holy Spirit. And God would press him out, and it would come out so powerfully that he had such an exousia, an authority about him, that people were convicted every single time he spoke. If you came in his presence, you either wanted to follow him and give him your life or take his life. That was the effect that the anointing that he carried had on people, which is really good. 
Because where there's no change of mind, there's no change of life. If there is no conviction, I know that nobody likes that word, but if there is no conviction, then there will be no repentance. If there's no repentance, there's no change. So can you imagine like walking with the Lord and saying, where I am right now, Lord, this is where it's going to stay. I ain't changing. I'm a little like you, but I don't want to be any more like you. Think of how, I don't know what word to use. Okay, that's one of them. I mean, it's, I think it's beyond dumb. It's crazy because our whole, our whole objective is to be like Yeshua. That's the objective. It, it does not matter what denomination you, 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 you run in. It doesn't in the sense that every single disciple of the Lord is to be discipled and to become more like Yeshua. And if you're not growing more like Yeshua, I have a newsflash for you. You're going away from Yeshua because there's no moment frozen in time. You can't stay where you are because God's on the move. Yes. So if you're not moving with him, guess what? Even if you stay still, you're moving away. Yes. Is that possible? Absolutely. Yes. It's the truth. Yes. It's the truth. The enemy doesn't want you to know that. You're good right where you are. Don't push, don't push the envelope. Just, you're all right. You know, face it. And, and this, this, this obsession of yours, look, nobody likes you. So is that the way you want to go through life? <laughs> Just calm down. Relax. The world's changing. You're still saved. Mistake. First of all, the mistake is listening to the enemy. Why are you conversing with him? You think anything good can come out of that? You think you're going to get him to repent? His fate is sealed. Leave him alone. Talk to God. So, they wanted to hear the word of God. They were pressing in. Man, people, listen, we're not going to ever have... Well, we have 10,000 people probably listening, but we're not going to be that congregation where people are. We can't compete anyway with the churches in Macon. We worship on Saturday. We're messianic. God didn't bring me here to compete. God brought me here to bring the word of God. And so we are going to attract, I think, people that are hungry for the word of God. Now, I'm not saying that the other churches are off. Maybe God's called them to be more seeker-friendly. And, and be more evangelistic. I just know what God's called me to do, and I'm going to respond to what he wants. Yes. Nothing more, nothing less. That's all I could be responsible for. So these people wanted to hear the word of God. He noticed two bo- boats pulled up on the beach, left there by fishermen who were cleaning their nets. Why are they cleaning their nets? Because nets are made out of rope, and after a long day at sea with the salt water and the fish oils and everything else, they tend to harden, stiffen, and shrink. And then they can't be used. They'll break. So they're, they're just finished their day. They finished their day of fishing, probably got out there at 4 in the morning. They're commercial fishermen. This is what they do for a living. If you've ever been on the Lake Inerit, there, are, it is, there is so much fish, it's unbelievable. And so they're, they're doing their thing, and they're done, and their boats are, are, are beached, and they're cleaning their nets, and they're ready to call it a day. They got to get up again at 3.30 in the morning tomorrow, you know? They're going to sell some of their catch because that's what they do for a living. They're going to take some of their catch because that's how they feed their families. And that, that's all. It's very normal. They're, they're human beings just like we are. And then he gets into one of the boats, the one belonging to Shimon. Obviously, he knew which boat he wanted to get into. And asked him to put out a little way from shore. Then he sat down, and what, did, what, is, what is, this is what Yeshua did in his whole ministry. Sat down and taught. Sat down and taught. Didn't have a rah-rah, sis, boom right. Didn't tell people how they can be prosperous. Amen. Didn't tell them how they could be better husbands and better employers and, you know, how they can raise their children. He taught the word of God. Look, I... Don't mean to be mean. Somebody asked me that day, Rabbi, what do you think of Joel Osteen? This is what I said. He seems like a really nice guy. I'm, I, I bet you he's a good husband. I bet you he's a good father. I bet you he has a good heart. He is incredibly motivating, but he is no minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, period. They 
They said, how can you say that? I said, because it's the truth. If he was sitting right here, I'd say, you seem like a great guy. And you're incredibly motivating. You're not preaching the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. I'm okay with that. He's a motivational speaker. Beautiful. Who are you? Are you called to be motivating? Or are you called to preach the gospel of the kingdom of heaven? So he taught the people. This is what I get from this. Yeshua used Peter's boat as a beamer. Well, for some of you that don't know, Bema is, this is a Bema. It's a raised platform. Ezra got on a Bema and preached the word of God. Pulpit, if you're more comfortable with that. He used his boat as a pulpit. My take is, whatever we yield to the Lord, he will use it. Let me show you a few gifts that Romans 12 speaks about. These are not... Spiritual gifts, these are more administrative gifts. Everybody here, and I'm not blowing smoke up your dress, is gifted. Everybody has some gifts, some multiple talents. But when God made you and he was knitting, he was knitting gifts into your DNA. Make no mistake. Now, the list that I'm going to show you is not exhaustive. It's just suggestive. It's not like, well, I've got to find one of my gifts. I'm one of the six. No. There's many more gifts. It's just a stuff. The Bible's small. It doesn't have enough room for all the gifts. But this gives you some idea. It's just a smidge. But the point is that as believers, we're responsible to use our gifts for the glory of God. Never, ever, 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 ever for self-glorification. Never. Our giftedness, whatever God has given, we have to give back to him. It says here, we have gifts that differ. And don't, you know, I think that's really important. Don't make your gift somebody else's. I I don't, look, I can barely deal with me. I don't want to deal with anybody like me. Wow. Wow. Some of you are going to be laughing all the way home, huh? (laughs) We have gifts that differ and which are meant to be used according to the grace that God has given us. Just whatever measure it is. And don't be jealous of anybody else's gifting. We're, We're a community. We're a family. We need all the different gifts. Desperately. Be excited when God brings somebody in with another gifting in our, in our kihilat. If your gift is prophecy, use it to the extent of your trust. A prophet today is one who declares the mind of God and is real, revealed in the Bible. He's not one of these guys on TV that tell you that you're going to work with AIDS patients. Let me send you a cup that I prayed over. Send me $39. That is somebody who's working for a non-profit organization. You follow? They're not, we don't need people foretelling us the future. We have prophets that did that. You, fi- you figure out revelation, you have enough to work on. And make sure you know your future and where you're going to end up. That's crucial because it might come sooner than later. If it is serving... Use it to serve. A servant serves in whatever capacity they are called to serve. We're not talking about a measure. We're all servants in a way. We're talking about somebody who has the gift of service. There are people out there, they love to serve. You would think, golly, how could they enjoy pulling weeds? Thank God they enjoy pulling weeds because most of you hate it. A servant's heart, I, I meet them all the time, beautiful. Because it's such a humble being to deal with a servant. If you are a teacher, use your gift in teaching. A teacher is one who explains the word of God and applies it to the hearts of the hearers. You follow? You, you, you just, not anybody can be a teacher. Not anybody has the gift of teaching. Everybody can teach at times, but there is a gift of teaching. There is an office of a teacher. There is an office of a servant. This is crucial. If you are a counselor, 
Use your gift to comfort and exhort. A counselor is one who stirs up the saints to desist from every evil and press on to achievements for the Lord. If you are someone who gives, now everybody gives, but that's not, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about somebody who has the gift of giving. A person with the gift of giving has a divine gift which inclines and empowers him or her to be aware of the needs and to fulfill those needs and help those needs. They're always looking who needs, who needs, and looking to give. That's a giver. Do it simply. Don't make a federal case and be generous. If you are in a position of leadership, everybody's a leader to an extent. A leader is associated with being an under-shepherd. The reason why when I sign things, Rabbi Greg, small r, big G, is because I work for the big rabbi. I'm just an under-shepherd. So a leader is associated with being an under-shepherd in a congregation. In this context, they're talking about not just a leader at home, but a leader in a congregation who stands in front of the flock and leads with care, but passion. Passion. If you don't have zeal, how can anybody else have it? It's trickle-down spirituality. It gets diluted when it comes from here, so you better have power packed because it's only going to dilute when it gets to the crowd. And by the way, a leader in a congregation doesn't drive the sheep. They lead the sheep. They lead by example. What they say is what they do. And then it says here, if you are one who does acts of mercy, well, everybody should be merciful. It just means tender loving. But there are people who have the gift of mercy. You ever meet them? Man, a person with the gift of mercy has this supernatural capacity and talent to aid those in distress. They can empathize. When they're crying with you, they are feeling your pain. Some people have multiple gifts. There are many other gifts. But whatever gift you have, man, use it for the glory of God. Use it for the glory of God. It's not just about addition and subtraction with the Lord. A lot of times it's about multiplication. The gift doesn't have to be spectacular. You know, we're so influenced by the world that we think it has to be something tremendous. It, it doesn't. Look at the little boy who just had two fish and five loaves. Do you ever notice why the Bible says barley loaves? Why didn't they just say loaves? What's the big deal? Barley was such a cheap grain. It was the grain of the poor. It was animal feed. God's showing even if you give me junk, if you give it to me, watch what I do with it. Whatever you have, you know, when I first got into ministry, I had nothing. I had no degree. I didn't know anything. And I told God, I have nothing. All I have is my heart, and I give it all to you. And he said, that's all I want. Watch what I do. The bottom line is I still don't have anything to give but my heart, and that's all God really wants of any of us. Love me with all your heart. If we yield our property and our possessions to the Lord, it's wonderful how he uses them and rewards us. I don't think any lover of God gives to get. I wouldn't think. I I just wouldn't think that would even be right. But we do get rewarded, don't we? It's never a one-way street with the Lord. It's always mutually beneficial. And more often than not, we always get back more than we give. By doing this, by giving the Lord our talents, we end up glorifying God, we end up blessing others, and we end up doing good to ourselves. Has anybody ever heard? In the world, it's not a win-win. In the world, it's always win-lose. Somebody's always taking advantage in business. They got to win, got to win, got to win, got to win. Sometimes people, I know people that are, that are billionaires, they don't need a dime, they still want to win. It's about the deal. I want to win. Hey. I won. I won. You know what? With God, it's not just a win-win. It's a win-win-win. Who's ever heard of this? God gets glorified, people get blessed, and you get blessed yourself. What 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 an economy he's running. You know, I just want to be part of that man. I detest the world and everything about it. I just don't want to be part of it. And I don't want the world to influence me or my family or Beth Yeshua. Now, there's a side note here. 
You know, one of the things, guys, that always amazed me, and I've, I've said it many times, so I'm sure that you've heard me, so this might be redundant. Forgive me, but people do learn from repetition, don't they? Yes. Sometimes we tell our kids something over and over again, and what do we say? How many times do I got to tell you? I'm telling you, if you put your ear to heaven, you're going to hear, how many times do I got to tell you? <laughs> but with that being said, the reason why, you know, I'm the mayor of Simpleton, and I need things very, very simple. And I know when Yeshua taught, he was teaching to very, very, very uneducated people. And he was using, you know, basic agricultural terminology that any five-year-old would understand. So everybody got the message clear and concise. There was no confusion in his message. And that's something I need. I like simplicity. I don't like complexity. And if you're intelligent here today, I applaud you. But clearly, you're intelligent enough to understand the simplicity. No? You can understand the simple. Yes? See, if you're super intelligent and I speak with, you know, seven-syllable words, then the simple might not understand it. But if you're super intelligent, surely you can understand simplicity. So it works for everybody. There is contrast in the Bible. There is no gray area. You know, um, there are too many choices today. Way too many. I liked it better when somebody needed a pair of glasses, right? You had the choice between the black frame or the black frame. Right. <laughs> Remember the Clark Kent glasses? Yes. And now if you go, I don't wear glasses, but, but I, I know that they go, well, pick a frame, and you're like, what? And that drives you crazy when there's too many choices. With God, there's always two choices. You can choose to build your house on the rock or the sand. There's no other material. You can choose to take a narrow road or a wide road. You can choose the holy or the profane. There's no intermediary choice. You can choose light or darkness. You can choose to be humble or proud. You can choose to be first or last. You could choose to be a sheep or a goat. And you could choose to be a saint, or you ain't. <laughs> but what I noticed for the first time, can we go back to Rome, uh, Luke 5, 1 through 3 for a sec, if I may? It says that he noticed there were two boats. And I just, you know, maybe I'm, maybe I'm reaching it, maybe I'm, maybe I'm just imagining something here, but... I just think it's an either or with the boats. The boat that hugged the shore caught nothing. You feel me? And the boat that went into deep waters caught so many fish that the nets tore apart. You ever see, forgive me, I'm going to be 60 this year, so I'm not young, but you ever see elderly people at the beach? They go in about their ankles, right. and they do this. Yes. <laughs> you ever see kids? Did you ever see any kid at the beach ever go into ankles and splash water on them? No. Unless, unless I could always tell the kid that's raised by the paranoid parent. That's the kid that does that, the panda. Watch out, be careful. They're on the beach. You know when Jaws came out in 1975? Do you remember that iconic movie? Do you remember the fear? You know, I'm out, I'm out in Long Island. Nobody went into the ocean when that movie came out. There were certain people that were so paranoid, they wouldn't take a bath, a bath, like a great white's going to show up in their bathtub. <laughs> But that's how it played on people's minds. It changed everybody's thinking going into the ocean. But when you see a little kid, when they get to the beach, they don't even, they don't even, right? Put your sunscreen. They're running into the ocean. Who's having fun? Who's having fun? Guys, I'm telling you, when it comes to the Lord, how do I say this nicely? You're missing out on so much when you hug the shore. Plus, you'll never know where your faith is if you hug the shore. 
See, faith that's not tested right. is not faith. Amen. It's a philosophy. Right. right? I mean, during that night we were dating, you know, she was a lot easier to get along with, so... Let me, let me try to put it in something that you can understand. When we were dating, it was fun, right? She lives where she lives. I live where I live. so much better. All right, let me try it again. Okay. When you're dating and you're seeing somebody once a week, right? Once a week, you've got your own life. They have their own life. And you get together on Saturday night. You go to a movie in Chinese. It's fun. It's easy it's easy and it's so easy to say i love you then you know you get married you have children you have mishaps you have issues you'll find out if you love that person or not as time goes on see while you were dating your love was never tested it has to be tested it has to be proven it's the same thing with faith and if you hug the shore how are you going to ever find out if god's faithful if you stay in the boat, you'll never know. All you'll have is philosophy. You'll have theology. You'll have scripture to quote. But you will never know if God is faithful. Right. You'll have stories about somebody else who experienced God's faith. But you'll have no story for yourself. Amen. So 5.3 says that he told Shimon to put out from shore, man. Let's, let's go out. Let's get out of here. You know, these people are just listening to me. Come on. Let me teach you something. So that takes us to the next verse, Luke 5, verse 4. It says, when he had finished speaking, he said to Shimon, put out into deep water. Deep water, not just a little bit. Not just, you know, whoo, whoo. <laughs> put out into deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Let me show you another section in Romans that I think is spectacular. Romans 5, 1 through 4. And this, this Shaul, the great apostle Paul, is speaking here about the benefits. In Romans 5, he starts speaking about the benefits of being saved, the benefits of being justified, okay? He says, so, he's gone over what it means to be justified. Now he's encouraging them, saying, do you have any idea how stupidly blessed you are? And 2,000 years later, I'm asking you the same thing. Nothing's changed. The Word of God, you don't, have to, you don't have to doctor up the Word of God. We don't need nothing new. God's doing a new thing. Really? You know, God's the same yesterday, today, February. He's doing the same thing. He's saving souls, sanctifying souls, discipling souls, and he's coming back to save them eternally. Doing the same thing. I know it might be boring to you, but I love it. Yes, sir. So since we have come to be considered righteous, I'm telling you, now he's going to get into the benefits. By God, because of our trust, let us continue to have shalom with God through our Lord Yeshua, the Messiah. Also through him and on the ground of our trust, we have gained access to this grace in which we stand. So let us boast. He's saying, man, you should be pretty pumped about the hope of experiencing God's glory. But not only that, and this goes on, I'm just giving you a smidge, four verses. Not only that, let us also boast in our troubles. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Am I in America? This ain't going to work. Sorry, I should have stopped it too. Because we know that troubles produce endurance. Endurance produces character. And character produces hope. All right, let's break this down a little bit. And then we just have one more section of Luke, and we are home free. Romans 5.1, so since we have come to be considered righteous by God through our trust, let us continue to have shalom and peace with God through our Lord Yeshua the Messiah. Guys, the first great benefit of being saved is we have peace with God. The war is over. Our soul is no more at war with the Spirit of God. We have been changed from foes. We were foes? Yes. Yes, enemies of God. Yes. Foes, look at the contrast, to friends by the miracle of grace. Hallelujah. We go from foes 
to friends by the miracle of somebody say hallelujah. Romans 5, 2, it says also, like that would be enough, right, Diana? Okay, I'm good. Let's leave. Ah, not so fast. I'm going to grind you till you hit your knees and say, man, what did I ever do to deserve this? Also through him, not so fast, Paul's saying, on the ground of our trust, we have gained access. What? In which we stand. Second benefit, we're not just acquitted, we're accepted and loved and now enjoy intimate fellowship with God. I'm going to tell you a little secret. On my little prayer walk, I only had one thing personal, but it brought me to my knees the second time. I said, God, just show up today. And he said, son, I'm your father. Don't worry about a thing. You know what that is to hear? For a guy that had a great dad and he left when I was 15 and I was never the same. We've gained access to this grace. Can you imagine? We can come in boldly. Dad, Abba, crazy. They didn't have that in the Old Testament. Shivering coming in now. Don't come in and throw your feet up and slap them in the back of the hands and say, what's up, Pops? Don't pull that. Don't abuse the grace. But you can go into his presence, almighty God, and call him Abba, Father. Somebody say Hallelujah. So he says, so let us boast. We're no longer strangers. We're sons. And it says experience in the hope, meaning one day we're going to be manifest in glory. I know you can Don't worry. Nobody can understand that. Nobody. But the least you could do is say, oh, my. That's the least you can do. Then we get to the tough part, 5-3. But not only that, see, everybody's like, woo, hurrah, hurrah. You know, it's a funny thing. We all want to praise the Lord and have the party and get the blessing. But when the hurrahs turn to crucify him, we know where to be found. Right? We know where to be found. So they're all pumped. All right, this sounds great. Not so fast. Not only that. No, I'm good with that. Dianu, Dianu. Let's stop it. Come on, Paul. Shh. Put a period. He says, but not only that, let us also boast in our troubles. Look, I preached one time in, remember in Orlando when I went to preach at that Chinese underground church? These are people that came out of the persecuted church in the 70s and late 60s. They were in Orlando. All Chinese church had an interpreter. And these are people who, they used to pray in China for persecution. Now, I know that's a little over the top. I'm not necessarily telling you to do that. But that was their prayer constantly because they knew that the gospel would expand through persecution, not through comfort. Like they got the first century. They were living the first century faith because they were being persecuted. They were being killed. If you told them, oh, don't worry, there's going to be pre trib rapture. They'd be like, we're getting killed now, dude. That's what happened in China. A bunch of nice Southern Baptist pastors went over and was teaching pre-trib rapture. And Corey Ten Boom was there. And they pulled Corey over and said, please tell them I know they're well-intentioned, but we're dying now. Go, go with me to India and tell the people that are being persecuted and beaten and killed. Don't worry about a thing. Everything's going to be fine. It's American religion. It's not necessarily biblical. So I'm preaching and preaching. It's kind of funny. And I'm, I'm in my third hour of preaching. Easy. Could have been there. And they wouldn't flinch. And let me go back to my point earlier, that when you're dating, you see how everything comes full circle? For you in the back, didn't hear what she said. She said, they used to persecution. So anyway, I'm on my third hour, and Jeremy's with me in the back, and he's like, like five years old. He wanted to come with me, and I wanted him to experience the reality of God. So I would take him anywhere that I knew God was going to show up. And... Um, He's in the back, and all of a sudden, he's in the back row, and it's like 11 o'clock at night, and he starts walking up, and I'm like, 
this is it. He is hearing from the Lord. I was one of you, prophet, and he's going to give me a word for these people, and I'm going to be done. And he comes walking, and everybody's watching, everybody's watching, he comes up to me, and he, I bend down, and he said, Dad, are you almost done? I'm really hungry. <laughs> And so, obviously, you know where he gets it from. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree. All right, getting back to our text. I'm not asking you, and I don't think the Bible's asking you, to boast in your present discomforts. The Bible says be thankful in all circumstances, not thankful for all circumstances. That would be crazy for God to ask you to say, thank you that my daughter or son was in a car accident and they're never going to walk. Hallelujah. That's, that's an extreme fundamental person who doesn't understand and has no common sense. But listen to me. I'm telling you, you have to be thankful for their eventual results. If you don't learn how to do this, look at me, sweet pea. You're going to struggle with incredible tension. Your life is going to be one where part of your heart loves God and part of your heart's constantly saying, what the heck is going on? Do you know what tension that's like to be half-hearted? It's poison. Trust me, everybody goes through it. But listen to what your rabbi's telling you. You have to figure out how to get wholehearted. This is the objective. It's not going to happen right away when you get saved, and it's not going to happen overnight. But if you never work towards it, it will never happen. We need to develop endurance yes, or a loyalty to faith. Yes. Did you hear what I said? Yes. We have to be loyal to the faith that we say we believe in. Yes. And we can't question in the dark what we once proclaimed in the light. Amen. This takes a lot of effort and it's a lifelong process. And this is what it means to be a Christian. Our faith has to be practical, just not theoretical. If our life were trouble-free, we would never be able to develop endurance. And because Yeshua said, in this world, you will have... Do you follow? Yes, in a perfect world, there would be no need for endurance. And when he comes back or we go, we're glorified, there's no need for endurance. The fight is over. But until that, you're in this world. So could it be that God is lovingly sending these things our way, each one has a different level of what they can endure, only to strengthen them for the next battle that arises? Could it be that God is doing this as a loving father? Could that be a possibility? That's what the Bible is telling us. That's what he's lovingly preparing us and helping us to be overcomers in the next trial. How do I know this? Look at the next verse. It says, endurance produces character, and character produces hope. Now, when God sees us bearing up under the trials and looking to him to work out his purposes through them, we get his good endurance seal of approval. Listen, I know that was a little bit of a distraction, but I need you to hear this. When God sees us bearing up under our trials and we look to him, it's, it's sometimes they're horrific, just horrific. I'm not judging anybody. It's, it's some things are difficult. Sometimes for certain people, little things are difficult. So it's, I, my difficulty might not be yours. So you are you, I am me. But when we, when we bear up under it and we look to God and we say, I don't really understand, it's killing me, but I love you. I love you. And if you permitted this or promoted this and I don't understand that I'm struggling, I love you. When he sees that, you get his good endurance seal of approval because you were tested and you're approved. And the sense of this approval fills us with hope, which is the anchor for our soul for the next storm. Knowing he is working in our lives and developing our character of proven worth gives us confidence that he will finish the work. Now, let me show you this word hope because I I, I was talking to a friend of mine 
He's a pastor of 46 years. He's watching. Hey, Chuck. And he told me he did a paper on this for his doctorate in Bible college. So he loves this word. There's two meanings. One is the expectation of good for the believer. And two is a joyful and confident expectation of eternal salvation. Look, one, the expectation of good. We choose to believe through our trials that God is going to somehow, some way, bring good out of it. No matter how messy it appears, if anybody can make lemonade out of lemons, it's our Lord. Even if it's to teach us a lesson, even if it's to change us, even if it's to humble us, all those things are good as far as God's economy is concerned. The joyful and confident expectation, I got news for you. People say they believe so much in eternity. I wonder if they do. I think a lot of people today, even believers, believe in the idea of it. They're hoping, but we need more. We need to believe so we can keep going toward that finish line. And that's what this does. When God sees us bearing up under these struggles, he empowers us with the Holy Spirit. The journey may be turbulent at times, but I'm telling you, the landing is going to be like a butterfly touching down with sore feet. Faith has deep waters. Today, we're a mile wide and an inch deep, especially in the body of Messiah. Deep calls out to deep, not shallow to shallow. Deep waters is where we're going to find our faith. Faith has depth. So does suffering, so does sorrow, and so does loss. Let me ask you something. When everything's going right, don't you get silly? Don't you get goofy? But when you're struggling, you find yourself on your knees crying out to God. Desperation's not a horrific thing in the kingdom of heaven. I got to tell you, it's in these things, suffering and sorrow, you ask any great theologian, past, present, and future, these are the things that bear much fruit and fill our nets. I'll tell you something. We were in Israel about maybe two years ago. I forget which trip it was. And my friend, my good friend who we're best buddies who tours with us, he said, Rabbi, uh, would your people like to go to a friend's winery? It's a little boutique winery in the Golan. And the Golan, they're producing some of the best wines in the world now because of the lava rock. And I said, ah, Herzl, I, I, I don't really drink. I mean, let me, let me just ask. Let me ask. So it was like 80 people, and about 74 hands went up, and I knew the other six were Southern Baptists. I knew. They didn't even have to tell me. So I went with them into, into, the, little, into the little gift shop, and we just sat and talked about how good it is not to drink wine. Anyway, it's, it's not biblical. I don't want to get into it. I taught it a gazillion times. I think I taught it a couple of months ago. But that doesn't mean, you know, beer is a borel or wine is a mocker. But it's, not, it's just not biblical. It's just a, a man-made religiosity. And it, it happened that way. It's sad, but it happened that way, and that's the way it is. Anyway, so I, I took the vote, so I said, all right, just bring them. So we go to this winery. Guy's father was in Musad. He was one of the nicest, sweetest guys. I'm thinking, you know, for me, anything without the Holy Spirit and without the Word of God is boring. And that just doesn't mean in Israel. It means like anywhere. My kids won't ask me a question because no matter what they ask me, hey, Dad, is this the way to screw things in? Well, the, the sheep go to the right. You know, they're going to get a biblical lesson, so they don't ask me anything anymore. They just walk around. And if, in the house, like, you know, headphones. Are, and then if they have any questions, like, where's Mom? Where's Mom? Do you have a question? No, 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 we're good. We're good. So if you ever get tired of your kids and you don't want to talk to them anymore, just teach them a lot about the Bible. And they'll stay away from you like the plague. But the guy was really, really sweet. And I'm sitting at this giant table with all these people, you know. And, um, <laughs> and um, you know, he just gives them four little glasses of wine. It was like 10 bucks or nothing. But I'm like, Lord, help me out here. There's got to be a lesson. There's a lesson in everything. Every, every bush is ablaze, but it's only people that are looking for it that take off their shoes. God's everywhere. And he's in everything. I'm not talking pantheism. I'm talking about one God who is 
omnipresent. And so I asked the young man, I said, may I ask a question? He said, sure, Rabbi. I said, I notice you don't have any irrigation here, and yet your wine is winning awards. What do you do in time to drought? He said, that's by design. We don't have irrigation. I said, how come? He said, because the grapevines that have to dig and dig and penetrate to find the water produce the best grapes. And I looked at everybody and I said, I'm done here. I'm going to go hang out with the Baptists. <laughs> you follow what I'm saying? Yeah. If things are given to you on a silver platter, they have no value. When you have to dig and dig and thirst and hunger for righteousness and you find it, it has value. And when things have value, you treasure it. You want to have your business run into the ground? Just give it to your kids. If they don't have to work for it, they will sell it and buy a Ferrari. And all those years you drive around that clunker. Ain't that something? Last but not least, Luke 4 through 5 of chapter 5, and we're done. It says, when he had finished speaking, he said to Shimon, put out into deep water. We went over that, but I wanted some context. Verse 5, Shimon answered, we've worked hard all night long, Rabbi, and I haven't caught a thing. But if you say so, I'll let down the nets. Now, I don't think Shimon, you can read into this any way you like. It doesn't, it doesn't give emotion. But I don't think he was being sarcastic. Now, he's being called in this section to be a disciple. And on our last lesson, we're going to learn what it is to be a disciple, because I have a newsflash for you. Every disciple is a Christian, but not every Christian is a disciple. And we are called to be disciples, not Christians. And we're going to get into this, and this is going to railroad your thinking, but I'm going to show you scripturally where Yeshua used the word disciple 200 times. He never used the word Christian the first time the word Christian was used in Acts 11.26 when it was a derogatory term. And I'm going to show you why you should be a disciple. That's later on. That's in two weeks, okay? But for now, he did have a relationship with him back in John. Just so you know, from Luke 4, 13 to 14, a year had passed. And you'll find that year in John chapters 2 through 5, where Yeshua ministered in Judea. This is like his second year of ministry, but this is where he's, he's not saying, hey, I just want students to listen to me. See, some of you are listening to me, some of you aren't even listening to me. But that's not what I want. God wants disciples, and so at this point, he's saying, hey, I've been teaching. You like it, you know? Everybody likes it, right? It's cool. I'm doing some healings. Like a dog and pony show, right? Remember that woman bent over? She's straightened up now. I'm giving you free food. Hey, anybody got some barley loaves? You can eat free. Everybody loves free food, right? And they love a show. But when push comes to shove, he was looking for not people who would, you know, walk with him out of curiosity, but die with him if need be. He was looking for disciples. And at this point, this is where he's like, Peter, we have a little bit of relationship. But do you want to be my disciple? He's now he's calling him to be a disciple. Okay. Peter is a fisherman. He's probably in his 20s here. He's, his father was probably a fisherman. Usually the trades are generational. So he's probably been fishing since he's two or three years old. Okay. Now, you know I know nothing about fishing. I was just on Lake Sinclair last week meeting with somebody. And I was talking to him. And he's, this guy's a good old boy. You know what I mean? I mean, like... I mean, he's, he's, he's rich and everything, but he's, he's a good old boy. You know, he came from nothing, he's a good old boy. And I'm on Lake Sinclair. The last time I was on Lake Sinclair is when Bernadette and I moved here. Yeah, the, you know, the, sto the story is that God brought us to Macon to preach. When I came to preach, he said, would you leave everything for me and come to Macon? So we got the call overnight to come here. We had no house, you know, no house. We were in Studios Plus on Riverside Drive, which, by the way, should be called Studios Minus, but that's another story. <laughs> We were in there, it was rainy, it was November, it was cold, I knew nobody, nobody understood me, I didn't understand anybody, I looked at Bernadette and I said, let's go home. She goes, we don't have a home anymore, Greg, we sold our house, we're moving here. I said, let's just go home, we'll come back next week. She goes, you're putting off the inevitable, we're coming here, God's called us, we're coming here. I said, but we've been looking for an apartment, we can't find one. All day long we looked. Then I said the stupidest thing, well, I said, if God really wants us to move here, let him find a place for us. Bernadette did the phone ring yes. how soon after i said that did the phone ring like within 60 seconds <laughs> uh, 
she answers the phone. She's talking to somebody. I'm not really paying attention. She goes, hold on a minute. She goes, Jonah, it's for you. <laughs> Honest. The guy gets on the phone. He says, hello, my name is so-and-so. He's pretty well-known in town. He doesn't, never went to our congregation. He said, I heard about your situation, your plight. I understand you have nowhere to live. He said, I have a house on Lake Sinclair. I'd like to give to you. I said, sir, we have no money. I'm not in a position to rent the house on Lake Sinclair. He said, I don't think you understand, Rabbi. I don't need money. It's all furnished. Bills, everything's taken care of for you. I said, why are you doing this? He said, it's okay. He met us. He said, it's right on the lake. There's a dock. You have little children. He gave me $40. At that time, we had two little children. Jeremy was a little and he said, here's $40. I said, what's this for? He says, buy two life jackets for them. I said, why are you doing this? He said, it's okay. We, we went up there in the middle of the night. Never knew what it was like, but the whole basement of this house had fishing rods. Now, I'm a city slicker, I'll admit it. But I said, how hard can it be? Now, some of you, some of you are serious fishermen. I know... Butch is a serious fisherman. I know Ben's a serious fisherman. You guys fish. Like, you know what you're doing. So I go to a store that said bait. I walk and I said, um, I need some worms. They said, what kind? I said, there's more than one? <laughs> they had bins, bins and bins of worms. And I said, yeah, I, whatever you think. He goes, what are you going to catch? And I went, <laughs> I said, what, what, what can you catch? He said, well, there's some good crappy. I said, that's like an oxymoron. How could crappy be good? Because I'm thinking, crappy. Anyway, he gives me some worms, and I, I go, and I don't want to put, the, you know, I asked Jeremy, put the worm on the hook. And he's a little skittish, but he puts it on, and I put it out, and I catch something. But I don't want to touch the fish. So, so I grab the rod, and I start swinging the uh, rod. And, and the thing's not flying off. So I put the rod down on the dock. I go inside. And I say, Bernadette, do you have a dish towel? So she gives me a dish towel. I put it on the fish. And I guess maybe it was a catfish or something. But I kind of jimmied it off the hook. But then he, he, he stuck on the dishcloth. So I'm banging the dish towel on the dock. Just as I'm doing it, a guy in a John boat. You know, boats like this big. You know the kind? White beard suspenders, a t-shirt that looks like some general ward in the Confederate Army. You know, it's like 200 years old. And he comes up, he goes, where are you from? <laughs> That's how he starts the conversation. So I said, well, we just moved here from Florida. He goes, no, no, where are you from? <laughs> and I said, New York City. He went, uh-huh. Uh. And I bet you he's somewhere in a bar right now telling that story. I guarantee you. So Peter is a commercial fisherman. He, he knows how to fish. Yeshua is a carpenter, a landlubber. He has no, he's just, he's not being sarcastic, but he's saying, we fished all night, all night, and caught nothing. Seriously? I don't think he's being sarcastic, but look what he said. This is, this is money, man. He says, but if you say so. But if you say so, there's not a lot of logic sometimes with the Lord. Trust me. He has told me so many wacky, wacky. When you walk up somebody in a Burger King and God says, tell them bread, and you say bread, and they start wailing because they were interviewing for a job at a bakery and they didn't know if they should take it. That's wacky. And I'm just dumb enough to go with it. What's the worst that can happen? I mean... Bread. Arrest him! He said bread! <laughs> but if you say so, listen to me, guys. Very, very important point, and then we're done. The Lord knows where the fish are running. He created them. They obey him. He knows where they are. Leaning on our own understanding, no matter how smart you may be, is futile when it comes to the kingdom of heaven. The secret for success in God's economy is to hear and obey what you hear. Period. 
putting all doctrine aside. We all agree mostly about doctrine. But when God tells you to do something, you're not going to necessarily find it only in the Bible. You're going to have to hear and respond to his voice. If you say so, I'll let down the nets, shows an incre the incredible value of being available and teachable and most importantly, faithful and obedient. Look at Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. It's not just a good bumper sticker or something you put on your fridge or something your kids learn at vacation Bible school. This is an out-and-out out command. God knew what he was saying 3,000 years ago when he said this. Nobody can refute this. There must be a full commitment to the Lord. Not just for our salvation. If you think that's where it ends, that's where it begins. For the direction of our lives. There must be a commitment without reserve. And listen, a healthy distrust in ourselves. Some of us are in the medical profession, in the business profession, IT, restaurant business, whatever it is, you are very good at what you do. You have learned your craft, but don't think you know so much about the kingdom of heaven. You have to be dependent on the God. You have to have a healthy distrust in yourselves. I don't trust me. You shouldn't trust you. I trust the Lord. We have to just admit at times, I don't know what's going on here, but if you say so, I'll let down my net. If you say so, if you say so, I'll let down my net. The next verse, and we're done with Scripture today, Proverbs 3, 6, in all your ways acknowledge him. Then, see, if you acknowledge him, if you seek his face, if you ask him, then he'll direct you. If, then, you're not going to get the then unless you do the if. There's a human side and a divine side to this equation. If you check with the boss, he will lead you in the direction that you need to go. God is saying in this verse that every area of our lives must be turned over to his control. Again, is this easy? No, there's something progressive about it. But if you don't even look at this as an objective, you'll never get there. Right. Our one and only desire is that we should know his will for our life. His will for your life is different than his will for my life. How? One way, through reading the Bible. Make no mistake, if you want to know the will of God for your life as a disciple, as a believer, you must read his word some of you didn't read the word today yesterday last week or the whole month that little verse that you're getting on your phone the little verse of the day the little you can do all things you're doing yourself a disservice not god god is god you will not change him whether you read or not read you must get in the word okay stop listening to music all day long and read the word of god for god's sakes that's one way. Second way is through the advice of, and let me, let me highlight, godly counsel. Yeah. Make sure somebody is wise that you're speaking to. Make sure somebody is proven, a proven commodity that they operate in the wisdom of the Lord. Godly counsel. Also through the inward peace of the Spirit. What do I mean about that? Darkness about going is light about staying. When you have no peace, it doesn't mean you're not going to have hurdles. But when you have no peace about doing something, that is the Holy Spirit saying, don't do that something. Amen. Darkness about going. Don't get emotional. I think maybe God's just, no. Peace has to be the umpire of your heart when you're making decision about your life, especially when God's in it. And let us not overlook the amazing converging of circumstances. You know, Samuel wrote to me, I just spoke to him this morning. When he wrote to me, he wrote to a lot of people. He wrote to a lot of people for help. Nobody responded. Who would? Who would? Would you? Would you send money to some guy sitting in an internet cafe in India who you never saw sight unseen? Would you send him money? Of course you wouldn't. Come on, be honest. You'd delete that email so quick. You would delete it so quick you wouldn't even entertain it. 
Why don't you trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your understanding? Why don't you acknowledge him in all your ways and he'll direct your paths? That's all I know how to do. I don't know if the guy's legit or not. I'm just Greg. So I asked the Lord. The Lord said yes right back to him. Okay? Samuel, this is Greg Hirschberg. Got your email. What can I do for you? His email was long. That was my email. Right? I said, Lord, help me understand if this is of you because I'm still not getting it. You told me to write back. What does he need? He said he needs 100 Bibles in his language. Samuel writes back, dear Rabbi Greg, I need 100 Bibles in Telugu. Yes or no? Boom. Converging of circumstances. Then the Lord tells me a couple of weeks later, go see him. Go see him. Go to India right after my massive surgery. Can't even walk right. Go to India. Go to a place that you don't know where you're going. You never heard of it. Muramanda, a village in southeast India. Go. So what happens? A lady comes in the congregation, and she's wearing Indian garb. It, to me, you know, you know when you have a relationship with God, you know when he's telling you something. Okay, I get it. I'm on my little van going over there from Groom. I sit next to this Middle Eastern woman. And she's very nervous because this is, you know, right after we had all this terrorism stuff go on. You could see she's very uncomfortable. Air conditioning is right on her in the van. I take her coat. She's trying to get it on. I said, may I help you, ma'am? I put a coat on her. She's like, she's nervous. And then she says, I said, what's your name? And she told me her name and said, what's your name? I said, well, today I'm Paul from Tarsus. And she said, I live in Tarsus. So I'm like, this is going to be a heck of a trip. Look what I would have missed out on if I hugged the shore. If I deleted that email, we now have 200 village congregations with 200 pastors. Look at what I would have missed if I hugged the shore and just threw the water on me and played it safe. If we really... Big if, want God's will for our lives, and we intend to obey what we hear, God will make the direction so obvious and so clear that to refuse him would be positive disobedience. Now, if you really want God's will for your life, I'm going to ask you to pray a prayer with me. But listen to me, I'm not trying to scare anybody. It's a covenant. God is a covenant maker and a covenant keeper. Not like us. Lord, in sickness and in poorness and health, wealth, whatever it is, covenant's over. Not with God. He takes it very seriously. This is what I said to God many years ago. Lord, I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, but I'm no bowling ball either. If you make it clear to me, I'll do it. If that's you, and you want to repeat that with me, feel free. Lord, I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed. Lord, I'm no bowling ball either. If you make it clear to me, I'll do it. Let's stand together. You've got plenty of time to study. You've got 166 hours in which you can study Luke 5. The rest of it, verses 6 to 10, will go over next week. And then the crescendo, or the big left hook, will be verse 11, where it says, leaving everything behind. And we'll get into what it means to be a disciple. It should be a, uh, a doozy. I really think so. I'm really excited about the Lord's word. And uh, as always, uh, be good to God and be good to each other. That's really what it's all about. And, and, and listen to his voice, and guys, obey it, because he's crazy about you, absolutely crazy about you. And I know a lot of people say to me, well, Rabbi, sometimes I don't know, sometimes I don't know. You know, i got to be honest with you. You know, uh, God goes to his go-to people. And if you have a lot of unfinished business with the Lord, sometimes he'll just find somebody else. If, if, if you know, the Jewish people were going to leave Persia, and if the book wasn't called Esther, it would have been called Miriam. That's what Mordecai said. Hey, you know, he's going to get somebody to do it. You want to be his guy. Don't you want to be that guy that when your name comes up in heaven, God says, oh, I could depend on that guy. You want to be his guy. So when you hear his voice, just do it. Just be flagrant. Be nuts. I mean, no matter what it costs you, because when it's over, you're going to be like, I feel so good.
you're going to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift up his very countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Prince of Peace, Yeshua. Shalom.